Okay, this is my own introduction. Um, I'll try to speak slowly. And um, if I'm talking too fast, please tell me, because it's a habit when I talk that I go blah, 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 blah. And so tell me. Um, I prepared these slides recently about my career and somebody said that it's useful, so I'm doing my own introduction. Um, this is a little bit about my university. That's a map of Australia. And I'm from the University of Queensland, which is the state of Queensland. And I'm at St. Lucia campus in Brisbane. Uh, there are several campuses throughout the state. Uh, this is one of the main buildings. It's a very old university, uh, 110 years old. Uh, many students and staff, not as big as USPE, which I learnt the other day. Uh, that's the building where my lab and um, my office is. And now there's a video I wanted to show you uh, about what my institute does. Um, Food is the fuel that drives our lives and our health. Every day we eat and everything that we eat is grown somewhere. Queensland has a strong track record in producing quality clean and green food from challenging tropical and subtropical environments. Helping drive innovation and growth in this sector is the Queensland Alliance for Agriculture and Food Innovation or COFI. Conceived in 2010 as a joint initiative between the Queensland Government and the University of Queensland, COFI has created a large critical mass of outstanding scientists working to improve agriculture and food industries in Queensland and globally. We apply cutting edge technologies to meet the global challenges and the potential of agriculture and food production in the tropics and subtropics. We translate fundamental science to applications and industries and harness information technology, nanotechnology and biotechnology for sustainable agriculture and food production. Our science spans the food supply chain from paddock to plate. Coffee and UQ attract the best people to study and collaborate with us. Together with our government, industry and our research collaborators, Coffee is helping meet current and future demand for safe, sustainable and nutritious food. Okay, that was just to explain that uh, my institute is about the agriculture and uh, innovations in agriculture. So uh, it's a very applied, although there's a lot of basic research, but just to explain where this has all come from. Oops, did all that already. Um, so my degree was in science, in a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology and Biochemistry, and I did honours in a livestock virus making monoclonal antibodies and I don't like cell culture so I did not do that for very long. My PhD was with the Faculty of Medicine in the same university and uh, this is where I did molecular methods to identify human disease called meliodosis. It exists in uh, Asia and Australia. Then I started during my PhD working for the Department of Primary Industries and this is where a lot of my research started um, in many different areas of bovine health, mostly. Uh, I went to the University of Queensland nine years ago 
and we established this new institute and then for the last few years I was appointed to professorial level. Um, significant achievements, personal and um, work-wise, uh, you know what a polymerase chain reaction is? My first one worked in 1989. I remember I had to go to somebody else's laboratory because there was one PCR machine in Brisbane at the time. That was exciting, so I realised I liked molecular biology better than immunology. Um, I, Babesia bovis is transmitted by the cattle tick. That's where I started working, um, trying to improve their live vaccine. And uh, the genotyping method was very useful because Australia successfully transmitted Babesia bovis through their cattle to New Caledonia when they export the cattle. And the tests we developed proved that Australia had infected the country. So. Uh, that wasn't very good, but uh, the importance of simple methods. TACMAN for Tritrichomonas is a venereal disease of cattle. Uh, we have vaccine patents for the paralysis tick vaccine and the cattle tick vaccines. On a personal level, I was a single parent doing most of this. Um, despite that, my daughter still did biophysics. She, she says she's smarter than I am because she did physics. And she's now doing a master's in medical physics. My other daughter is autistic and under my care. I ran a conference that Pet attended a few years ago in Australia. A large amount of funding at the moment. Meat and Livestock Australia is a body that the farmers pay money to them from their cattle to help support research. So we have to do research that is helping the farmers if they are paying for it. And ARC is Australian Research Council, I'm sure, similar to whatever you have here. I can't remember. Um, there's also been developing an agriculture biotechnology master's field of study, which is, um, which is good, I think. Uh, on a personal note, I haven't been training for a while, but don't mess with me. Um, I enjoy a few hobbies there, but uh, we can talk about that later today. So these are the two current very important projects. We're also looking at bio biomarkers for cattle resistance. We're looking at diagnostic methods still for venereal disease in cattle. We're looking at the mi microbiome or pathobiome associated with infertility. And I'm interested in ectopyrocyte genomics. And there's a group photo. You can see there's not many Australians in the lab. There is one. Uh, <laughs> So it's a very diverse group and obviously developing this new master's course. So that was that introduction. I hope that wasn't too boring. And now, I don't know which tick word is my favorite. I think maybe fanatic, but uh, let's see how we go. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to go through all the funding bodies, but I always need to thank p uh, many other people I am here because of the work of many people. Um, this is the outline of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I won't talk about the paralysis tick vaccine if you start to fall asleep. Uh, we'll see. Uh, Bruno will tell me whether you're sleeping or not. You need a big stick so you can poke them and wake them up. <laughs> um, so what are ticks? It's a good question. So here is sort of a phylogenomic tree. Um, it shows you where two of the main tick species, Ixodes scapularis is in the US and transmits Lyme disease to people, and Boophilus or Ripocephalus microplus, the cattle tick, is the, probably the most globally um, significant tick species, at least for agriculture. Um, you can see insects are up here, nematodes are here, ticks sort of sit in the middle. They are closely related to spiders, uh, which is the arachnida. And there are three sort of families of ticks. The hard ticks, which are mostly what I'm talking about, the soft ticks, and one species in this one family called Natalelidae, which only exists in South Africa. And um, this diagram was from this publication. That's just to give you a perspective. So what are they? They're mini vampires. That's what they are. They feed on anything except grass and stuff like that. Um, 
The second to mosquitoes, I've heard you have been talking a lot about mosquitoes so far. Uh, mosquitoes are still the first most important vector of disease, but ticks the second. They transmit several species, uh, several diseases, viruses, bacteria and protozoa. There's 182 species, 92 species worldwide. In Australia, which is a little bit what I talk about, obviously in my normal lectures, we have 70 of these species. Five of these were introduced into Australia. Cattle tick was probably introduced into Brazil as well. It doesn't, didn't, didn't evolve here. And uh, I'll explain a little bit about that. Cattle tick is a cryptic species complex. There's some pictures, it's a tick. And paralysis tick is Ixodes holocyclus in Australia and it tends to um, paralyze pets and they can die. So it's what it looks like a typical Ixodes tick. So when you look at evolution, I really like this table. It was put together by Steve Barker, uh, a tick or ectoparasite taxonomist also at my university. But when you go through the, this is millions of years ago, MYA, and you look at where people think ticks evolved, um, I find this quite amusing because Ben Manns, he was here in May, no, no, you didn't have him, sorry. Ben Manns in South Africa says it developed here in South Africa. Dobson and Barker say it developed in Australia and here also Australia, but, um, and here he says Africa. So there's still debate, but what I found interesting was um, they found ticks in amber and um, do you all know what amber is? This stone jewellery. And um, they found it. <laughs> amber, yeah. I think this is 100 million years ago where they found, and I thought that was pretty cool. I have yet to buy an amber with a tick in it. I can only find with insects or with uh, spiders so far. But it would be nice to have a piece. Um, this is a video. Um, of larvae attaching to cattle and there's the larger female feeding there on the right. Um, normally you can't see larvae, they're like a speck. It's, you can't see it. So one of our students found an app that you could put on the phone and, and use it as a microscope and they made this video so it was pretty useful. Um, so tick, cattle ticks spread with the migration of cattle. And I'm not going to go through all of this. This is in case you can't remember Roman numerals, but um, you can see, at least in Brazil, you had a migration of Taurus cattle and Balsindicus. So Taurus cattle are your ones that are um, mostly European and the ones that we mostly have milk from. Uh, the ones with the hump are the Balsindicus cattle which are resistant to ticks. They, they, ticks evolved on that, those cattle. Um, but these cattle get very sick. Um, when it comes to Australia, uh, the Bos Indicus were imported from Indonesia with ticks on them in the no very north of Australia, up here. And the normal Holstein Frisian, these ones were sort of brought in down here, which is where most of our dairy industry is in Australia. just shows you the difference between the breeds. Um, tick life cycle. This particular tick lives for 21 days, going through larvae to, adult, uh, to nymphs, which are the teenage stage, and then female, ad female adults and males. And then the females, when they engorge, they drop and lay the eggs in the grass, which convert to larvae. This is a 21, roughly, day life cycle and this is not the size the real size of the ticks so that you know that's just a representation or it's a little cow um, these are the two parasites these are meant to be red blood cells this is rickettsia anaplasma babesia bigemina and babesia bobus sort of depicted here in this diagram as i said it's a species complex it's a one host tick they don't really feed on people they transmit tick fever. Larvae can survive for a long time in the grass. 
And just for the sake of phylogeny, um, they've broken up all the, I guess, geographic strains of the species. In, they call it Australis for Australia. I find that very amusing because it was introduced into Australia. So it, to me, they're sort of geographical uh, variants, although we do have Annulatus, which has always been a separate species. But, um, and the Australis clade is very similar to the global Microplus clade, but in any case. Um, I've tried to adapt this diagram to show a more accurate representation of where cattle ticks have been found. The black is from this publication. The stripes is, is my art, it's not very good, but I'm still trying to refine this and I'm going to talk to some people here as to how accurate they think that is. Uh, there are a lot of cattle in the world and 80% of them can be susceptible to ticks and the diseases, costing quite a lot of money every year. And there are several chemicals. There's probably, these are the Australian brands. I'm sure you have the, yeah. No, 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 they're in a region where there are ticks. So tropical and subtropical parts of the world. And that's where most of the cattle are. So 80% of the cattle in the world are in areas that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's widespread resistance to these chemi chemicals in Brazil. Um, from what I understand, it's not regulated here, the use. Uh, to compare to Australia, there are rules that producers have to follow otherwise they get fined. From what I understand, here they just use them. It's not regulated. Hopefully that'll happen in the future. Now the reason why there's widespread resistance is because people don't follow the rules if that makes sense. So there would be less resistance if people were just not throwing chemicals all over the cattle all the time. But um, it's, I'm not going to go through the different drug areas, but um, they're the main areas, the main families of chemicals used for ticks at the moment. Um, I'm going to introduce you to paralysis tick, but if we don't have time to talk about the vaccine, we won't because I don't want to put you to sleep before pets because Pet is really tired, he will put you to sleep, so. <laughs> um, paralysis tick, um, Ixodes holocyclus, only in Australia. It's, it feeds on three hosts, very short, on each stage. Paralysis is caused by a family of toxins. Uh, the adult female feeds for about four days as a peak production of toxins at that point. It affects companion animals and they die very costly treatments and it does affect a lot of livestock as well. This particular tick species um, feeds on anything. Um, very opportunistic. That's my dog. <laughs> um, you might ask why I'm working on a dog parasite in an agriculture institute. There's some things they do allow us to do. So this was sort of a side project. Um, it has a world, a sort of annual life cycle uh, based on the season. So right now in Australia is spring and these adult females are looking to feed on our dogs. So for instance, my dog has to have every fortnight uh, treatment to stop a tick from uh, killing her, I guess. There she is again. Uh, this tick is indigenous to Australia and it evolved on the marsupials. There are these small rat looking kangaroo things called bandicoots. Uh, there's sort of a, a picture of one here. They're very small and they live in the ground and they carry many high numbers of these paralysis ticks and they drop them in the grass. Uh, they do go on possums as well, but possums are up in trees and less likely to drop them on the ground. It's really the bandicoots that are the reason why there are ticks in the grass. Um, even young children can be paralysed if the tick is feeding for long enough somewhere. Um, it causes respiratory muscle failure. One tick can kill a large dog. 
And there's also some transmission of some diseases in Australia by this tick. There's a rickettsial spotted fever. We don't have Lyme disease, but there is another similar sort of diseases from rickettsia. So there are these preventatives that we give. This is a drop on, this is a chewable tablet. I don't really like the, these are new. The dog has to take this tablet, which is essentially pesticide, but the tick has to take a bite to get the pesticide and then die. I don't like it because I don't like feeding the dog this chemical. It's just, and there are dogs that have reactions and cannot have those. I stick with this drop thing on the outside of the dog, seems to be fine, and it repels the tick from feeding in the first place. Uh, there is a treatment which is an anti-dog serum made from hyperimmune dogs. All they do is put lots of ticks on these dogs, make them sort of immune, collect that serum, and when a dog is paralysed, that serum is used to treat the dog to try and reverse the paralysis. Here is a dog with the back legs paralysed. Here is a dog on a respirator. This is my dog that died from one of these ticks a long time ago. Uh, that's just sort of, it's a very crude and they've been making it the same way since the 1960s. Uh, so, yep. Toxin. Mm -hmm. Family of toxins. Um, this is the effects to this anti-serum, which can make them sick, and some of them are still euthanized. And, and this is my healthy little dog over here again. For those of you bored, the dog pictures in the corner are just to entertain you. So that's the background and the problems, at least with these two tick species. I just wanted to briefly touch on genomics. Um, these ticks have very big genomes. So the human genome is 2.4 gigabases. Uh, the cattle tick is 7.1. It's huge. Uh, that's where ectoparasites, well, these ticks, size of their genome sit up with, with um, mammals. Protozoa, the reason why this has such a big spread is there is one amoeba that has this huge genome, but most, most protozoa are down here. Just to give you perspective on sequences and sequence data and we'll see and see why. So some early work on tick genomes using reassociation kinetics. Um, they were trying to work out what sort of genomes ticks have. This is where they determine the size of these two main species. And they found that there were a very highly repetitive sequences through the genome. I'm not going to explain that. They also have a similar male uh, determination as insects rather than XY like we do in mammals. There's this XO for a male tick. Long stretches of low complexity sequence, that's what these repeats are about. And these repeats are usually at the end of the chromosome. So what some research has done is try and um, enrich the part of the chromosome that has the coding genes. We're not interested in these big long repeat sequences. They may have a function, but when it comes to vaccine discovery, which is what I'm talking about, we're not interested in them. So the Ixodes scapularis genome project started in 2005 and finished in 2016. They started using old techniques. Uh, it took them a very long time to get to here. In the meanwhile, uh, things, uh, uh, long, long sequencing methods became available and one of those is PacBio and uh, they, they sort of did the cattle tick genome but they did start which is what called the first PacBio in 2010, which is still not as good as the PacBio now. And this group probably took a couple of years to sequence theirs. The, they started in 2010. I don't know how long. Petra might know more about the Exodes ricinus genome group, but they did it fairly quickly using the most recent PacBio. Just to give you an idea of how evolution of gene se t genome, uh, DNA sequencing then improves what we can do, at least with species like ticks. When we started this work on Ixodes holocyclus, there was no data um, for it at all. So that's sort of genome sequencing issues, which brings me to the main topic, which is reverse vaccinology for cattle tick. Um, I'm going to take you back into the history of vaccinology. 
um, you might have heard of smallpox. So Jenner, Edward Jenner in 1798, you can find his document now because I've printed it off Google. This is where you can find it. It's so cool. It has his report from 1798. Uh, what he determined was that women who were milking cattle did not get smallpox. So they got cowpox and that protected them from smallpox. So he started giving people uh, cowpox by scratching uh, the virus here onto the skin. They get these scabs and they would recover. He called it variolation. But if you have time and, and you're bored and you're mad like I am, go have a look at his report. Just something written from 1798 is really fascinating. Then there came Louis Pasteur. You've heard of the word pasteurization. He was the person that determined that there were pathogens that caused the disease, that there were uh, microorganisms and he started to grow them. And he made vaccines against foul cholera, which is a chicken bacteria, anthrax, which is another bacteria, and rabies, which is a virus. Um, he made early vaccines by attenuating or inactivating uh, a graft to regrew these pathogens. So there's a picture of Pasteur in this diagram here. This is a diagram about what they call traditional vaccinology, where people use whole vaccines, virus particles, or live attenuated vaccines, and in some cases some recombinant vaccines. But it had to do with isolating and inactivating the or causative organism. So in parasitology, which I've focused on, there are many virus and bacterial applications, but in parasitology, they've done very well in making a lot of um, live and live attenuated vaccines that have been used mostly in, in livestock um, rather than people, but these have worked quite well um, in agriculture to control certain diseases. Um, when it comes to cattle tick, very early on, there was a discovery of this antigen called BM86. It was discovered in 1986. BM being Boophilus microplus. It's very, it still don't really know entirely what the function of this protein is. It led to the production of two different vaccines, same protein. One is tick guard in Australia and GAVAC in Cuba. The Australian vaccine is no longer on the market. The Cuban one is still sold. Um, one of the issues with this vaccine was that it didn't have um, conserved efficacy in every country. It had variable um, results in Brazil. This is some work mostly done by Embrapa. It worked really well in Australia, worked really well in uh, Cuba, but it was very variable. And this is one of the reasons why we started looking for different vaccine antigens. So what is reverse vaccinology? I'll let you read this. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a Wikipedia definition, but it pretty much covers it. Too fast? I won't go faster though. <laughs> Just you let me know about whether to go into paralysis too. So it says outer membrane proteins. That's because this sort of vaccine appro uh, genome approach was first developed on viruses and bacteria, and often in bacteria, outer membrane proteins are vaccine candidates. And then the idea is to then just go and test everything in a sort of wet lab screening method. This is the original conventional development, whereas reverse vaccinology is you start with sequences and just predict certain uh, aspects of those sequences and then screen them all in the lab and then test them as a vaccine. So when we started in 2005, there was no cattle tick genome. At the time, it, it was going to cost a lot of money to sequence it. So, but what we had was express sequence tags um, that were isolated from the US Department of Agriculture um, from a collection of, of tick samples they had. Um, and we're just going to go back in time. So this was our sort of pipeline. You can see 2005, we have those sequences from the US. We also did some of our own discovery. So 
what we did was they had their database, we did some of our own discovery. I'm going to sort of break this down. What happened was we looked in what was the PFAM database at the time. We looked at anything that was extracellular, membrane bound, secreted or had the term antigen and we downloaded all those sequences out of this database. The student clustered them, made a consensus and then blasted this database to identify anything that matched any of these and he came up with 300 candidates. Hello. Um, this is the publication of the database, not publication of what we did, but this was just the database that we used. Um, now, that database consisted of ticks that had variable resistance to acaricides or pesticides. They didn't really have um, in that database ticks or larvae that were sensing the host, which we thought would be important to look at what are larvae, what, what uh, genes are being expressed in larvae that can smell the host but can't attach. So this is a bag with larvae in it that we stick on the side of the animal. And then we retrieved those larvae and extracted the RNA from them. This is a female tick lifted up with the forceps, the male are usually underneath a female and we collected males and we collected females. We also put females in a bag to see what they are expressing while they're trying to attach. So our theory was in making a vaccine, you, you want to repel the attachment. So we wanted to enrich this sequences by doing this study. It was called suppressive subtractive hybridization. It's not trendy anymore. We just do transcriptome sequencing now, but that's why I wanted to travel back in time with you and it's a bit that's an output of the um, larvae the difference between feeding larvae and sensing larvae bit of a difference between the sort of proteins that were identified as being upregulated what happens in suppress suppressive subtractive hybridization is you have larvae that are in a tube in the lab that are not sensing an animal you subtract what RNA, those larvae are doing away, so you're trying to isolate the RNA that's being expressed by the larvae that are having a different activity. I don't know if I've explained that. So we were looking for transcripts associated with host attachment and feeding. We had five, lab five libraries. This is really small compared to what you can do now. We had clones associated with unattached frustrated larvae. We called them frustrated because they couldn't attach. Feeding larvae, unattached frustrated adult female ticks, feeding adult and male adult ticks. Now what we did then was we sort of brought those, remember these were from the USDA uh, database. These were the clones that we identified from the subtraction library. And we did more analysis on them to see if they were secreted, membrane bound, and to see sort of what they annotated as. And we came up with 99. We had to join these two together. And anything that had bovine homology, we removed. And so really, we had 69 candidates at this point. So what we decided to do was look at, um, there's a, there was a technique at the time, which again we don't use much more, more is a microarray. We wanted to see what were larvae doing when they were trying to attach to a res tick resistant animal as compared to a tick susceptible animal with the idea of if the tick is producing certain proteins on a tick resistant, are those proteins going to be better vaccine candidates, for example. So everything before that these previous, um, all of these here, 
All of these were from tick susceptible animals, these sequences. So we did this experiment, again using frustrated larvae, comparing tick resistant, tick susceptible in the background there. And um, I don't want to show you everything, but we just get more information, highly expressed in, in um, frustrated larvae, Brahmin are resistant, Holstein Frisian is susceptible, and then what's down regulated and the fold change. So we isolated anything that was of interest that was differentially expressed by ticks that were trying to feed on a resistant animal, just so that you can see where this is going. So then we then added another 195 from this experiment sequences that were differentially expressed by tick resistant and we repeated the bioinformatics and we came up with 302 sequences to move on with. So hopefully that's this discovery phase that I tried to explain. Next phase was this localization and screening phase. Obviously we're not going to express 300 antigens and test them in cuddle so we got to do something. So I've ticked here the microarray, that's already been done. That's why the numbers don't correlate. We went to look at um, RT-PCR. So we did 281 RT-PCRs. This is the legend down here. Unfed larvae, frustrated larvae, nymphs, males, frustrated females, feeding females. The gut from the female, salivary gland from the female, and ovary gland, ovaries, sorry, from the female. So we looked at every single, those 281 that we could amplify to see where they localised. The idea is we, we weren't going to pick something that only localised in the male tick, as an example. Um, or we tried to pick, so you can see this particular one is spread out. This one seems to be highly present in frustrated larvae, less in other phrases. So it was another screening method. We've only got 281 because um, out of the other 19, we just couldn't get any gene expression RT-PCR results, so they were deleted. Um, the next part, so here are these RT-PCR analyses. Then we clustered them and did some epitope analysis. I don't want to go in a lot of detail of that, but this is BM86, which is that vaccine that we talked about and what we did was we tested it in all these different sort of epitope these are b-cell binding epitopes antibody binding epitopes and down here is this bepipred and these blocks show potential b-cell binding regions and what is here is hydrophilicity so <coughs> there's a, a, a b-cell binding epitope on a protein is not going to be hydrophobic it's going to it's, if it's hydrophobic, it sort of tends to be inside the membrane, but hydrophilic will stick out, so it's going to bind to antibodies. So um, what I've got here is a bunch of other programs that we looked at. We went with Bepipred. It seemed to match nicely with the hydrophilic, and um, it also matched... Well, it didn't exactly. We tried to match it with some gnome epitope work that was done on this um, BM86, but in the end, for several reasons, we chose this BepiPred program and we screened all the sequences that we had and came up with 748 epitopes to about 250 proteins. Does that make sense? So then we made them synthetically. And this is where we went here. So we made all those peptides and we screened them with serum from resistant and susceptible cattle. That's a lot of ELISA. Um, it's just ELISA plates. These antibody, these peptides were linked to um, biotin so that you could stick them to the plate and then you do a strept avidin assay. And there you go, lots of ELISAs. So what we did was these are families of different tick genes. These are unknowns. A big unknown group, but these are different sort of families or different categories that we'd sort of categorised our uh, vaccines into. You can see there's this dark orange susceptible and resistant, and this light orange were susceptible only. So going with our theory, anything that was recognised by susceptible cattle only was removed, and then we only concentrated on these. 
which was about 76 EST. So we're getting smaller and smaller. So we made antibodies to those 76 peptides and we fed them in vitro to female adults. So these female adult ticks, um, we were, they removed from the cattle the day before they gorged, so they're hungry. It's 24 hours before they take a big drink of blood. So they're removed, we check their mouth parts. If the mouth parts are damaged, they won't feed properly. And um, we force feed them the serum, the anti-serum, which, which were made in sheep at the time. And we gave them blood, they fed overnight, and we put the tick into a tube to see if they would lay eggs. Some of them died. This um, tick here has red legs because it's died. This one is still waving. It's not a video, but you can tell the difference. Supposed to the dead tick. And these are where the eggs come out. These are dried eggs. These are good eggs that are uh, forming larvae. All of this can be done in the lab. Very time consuming, but we fed a lot of ticks and um, made sure with the right controls that we came up with efficacy data, which led us to about 20 ESTs mainly. So we categorised this sort of feeding results and um, BM86 antiserum sort of sat here. So we went with anything in this area. We had some very dramatic effects from some serum, from some serum. Um, and from there, which is where we started making, doing vaccine trials. So we did vaccine trial mixtures. One particular mixture gave us 73% efficacy. This is the low number of ticks. And this was quite a while ago. We had several different mixtures that we tested at the time. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail, but it's from there that the next phase of the work was, oh, I forgot. So, to summarise, this is sort of the main attributes of our vaccines. The, we used an express sequence tag, not a genome sequence. We isolated sequences that were differentially expressed from different stages, recognised by resistant cattle, binding to B cells, sorry, antibodies, different life stages and organs prevalence, the in vitro feeding model and the in vivo testing. So then we had to go to individual testing. Uh, you can imagine that cattle trials take a while and really expensive, so that's why first was mixtures before we go down to individuals. Um, this is what our facility looks like. When you challenge cattle, they have a pen that they stand in. In here is a caricide, so that ticks can't escape from the facility. And every day when the ticks are dropping, they're washed and there's a basket out the back which collects the ticks and then they're monitored. It's a soft wash, um, so the ticks are very much alive. They're not washed forcibly. Um, 11 out of those 20 just didn't have any efficacies. Uh, we had six that ranged from 38 to 65, and this is a single peptide as a vaccine. It's not a recombinant, still a small B cell epitope. And these are our favourite four. Um, as a single peptide, just a single peptide, they had these efficacies. Uh, one of them we've tested as the whole recombinant and it increases efficacy quite by a lot when you use a whole protein. We're testing these as whole proteins. We also have made a construct of peptides. We're trying to see if they can be synergistic. synergistic. If we mix peptides together, which are linked to a carrier protein, they're not synergistic. For some reason, one dominates, and I'm not quite sure. I think that still might happen here in these constructs that we've made, but we will soon find out. That's where we are right now. So that was quite involved. Did anyone have any questions about that part? Looks like you're going to hear about paralysis tick now. <laughs> so that was using, as you can see, some really old methods. And, and if we'd started this today, could you imagine we would have just done the genome really quickly and done it completely differently. But that's why I called it older omics. Because really since 2010, we've been doing trials. The discovery part finished a long time ago. 
um, Back to the Future. So this slide was for, well, this paralysis tick was stuck in this woman's ear for two weeks and her face became paralysed. She didn't know she had the tick in the ear under the wax. She went to five different doctors before one doctor finally cleaned out her ear and found the tick and killed it. Um, it's a pretty horrible story. It's only happened last year near where I live at the Sunshine Coast near Brisbane. Um, it's very hard to see. Um, but um, she said the doctors were coming up with all sorts of ideas. Um, they just saw a build-up of wax. Uh, 12 days from the first earache symptoms, they found it. It wasn't until she was vomiting and that she collapsed that they decided to try and find it. Um, the doctor injected something and removed it. She was a veterinarian herself. Uh, so she had about three weeks off work. The facial paralysis settled in a couple of days, but she's still dizzy. And she was concerned of contracting Lyme disease, which is really dumb because we don't have it, or tick typhus, which is possible. But then she points out that obviously there was a dog or a cat where she worked that had, some, had a tick on it, but it, very small. And what I'm adding here is this is my daughter's ear after she came back from hiking when she's sitting there watching television and she has few earrings like some of you. And um, I'm like, what's that? She goes, oh, it's just my earring. I go, no, it's not. <laughs> so she was home for two days. That was a paralysis tick, just got to that little size. So you could see it's how close this is that to her ear, right? And you, if you don't feel it, because they're, they're injecting toxin, you can't feel it, right? They're anesthetizing you. It's a very tricky tick. So you don't know unless it's itchy that, you know, that there's a tick there. So you can see how it could happen. Most humans, you know, we see it, so we remove it. Obviously, dogs with hair, we can't, they can't see them. So they're very dangerous um, and scary. So we took it to the lab and extracted RNA from it. <laughs> um, so I don't know how many of you have dissected ticks before. Um, Okay, so the salivary glands sit here and this is the f top of the tick taken off and they look like grapes. Um, sorry, I thought I had them there. They're, they're there, but it's not, it's not very well visible, but they look like small grapes. That was the important part to dissect out of these ticks for this work. And this was a couple of years ago and um, it was extract the salivary glands and we'd extracted all the other organs as another sample and we just submitted it to uh, sequencing. Very easy to do now. And we made a sequence database. I've put students' names, different students have been involved with this work. So we found about 19 of these different toxins. HT1 was discovered in the 90s and that was the last time before anybody did any work in this area. Um, we isolated the most immunogenic and we did a proof of concept dog trial. Um, this is just to show you different sequences and how similar they are. This is a spider toxin as an outgroup if anyone is, understands how to do trees. HT16 and HT17 are quite different. HT14, H, sorry, HT4 is quite different. Um, HT4 uh, when we test it in neonates, it kills them in an hour. And neonate m mice are a model to use where we test toxin activity. Um, I could talk more about the toxin structure. Um, all I can say is it's, it's a small peptide. It has four disulfide bonds to fold, has to be folded to be active. Um, so they're a bit tricky to produce as a recombinant. So we've made them as uh, peptides. But the cocktail vaccine sort of had one of these, one of these, and several through here. But you can see there are some very similar to each other, but we picked the most immunogenic and also the most diverse to put in the vaccine. Um, so the dogs were challenged after three, three uh, vaccinations of a cocktail, and 
they they were protected from paralysis compared to the control group that um, obviously became paralysed from tick challenge. I uh, had a PhD student looking at the proteome at the same time. Um, the only good part about this is that it just confirmed what we found in the transcriptome um, and what were the most immunogenic. He seemed to find most of them in the proteome. As you can understand, transcriptome doesn't tell you so much what might end up being produced, if that makes sense, whereas the proteome will give you a better an idea of what is there. Transcriptome gives you messenger RNA. Proteome gives you the protein. Yeah. So his proteomic uh, analysis of uh, sort of verified what we put in the vaccine in the end, I guess. We'd already done it before he did the proteomics, but it's just um, we enjoy looking at. Uh, well, now as I, as I'm, I feel like I'm repeating myself. The techniques you have available to you now um, are so much more sensitive and easy to use even uh, compared to, say, the molecular biology we had to do 10, 15 years ago. Um, I, I say to my students that there's almost, you send everything away. You prepare the RNA and send it away for someone to give you the sequence. You, you prepare your protein and you give it to the proteomics facility for them to then give you the data. Uh, and so I find the students are learning more about data analysis than lab work now. It just seems to be the way things are going. Sequencing, we used to do our own sequencing gels. Now sequencing, we send it away. Um, so that was more modern omics, I guess, compared to the previous. So we are going pretty fast, yeah. Um, so we're at the commercialization phase. Um, I guess what we did was develop ectoparasite vaccines using different worldly methods of molecular biology and um, but the challenge has been the size of these genomes. It would be nice to just do genome sequencing, have your reference genome and then go do all the transcriptome and proteomic work. It's not how lovely it was for us. The vaccine full patents um, have sort of been submitted last year. The paralysis one is published online. And at the moment, we're trying to make, for both of them, multi-epitope vaccines. The challenge with the paralysis tick is uh, making active recombinant toxins in, a re um, in yeast is what we're trying to do is a bit of a challenge. All our dog experiments were done with synthetic peptides, which are easy to produce. but that's very expensive to then take to a company and make a cocktail. So we, last year we had a, a student work on recombinant production um, and we, we again we worked with a protein expression facility. When we tried to express toxins ourselves, uh, we killed two students in that process, not literally. But <laughs> we, so again, do you, I didn't want to be a laboratory that was going to develop a recombinant expression system, we needed to make it. So we went to people that are experts in making it. We can express proteins, but for whatever reason, we couldn't express the toxins. We're not toxin experts either. There are labs that work on toxin expression. Again, I didn't really want to become toxin expression expert. We, needed to we wanted to vaccinate animals. So we now are hoping we can make the whole cocktail and, and there's a small company that is going to test them in their dogs. Um, that company in Australia makes that anti-serum that I talked about. Uh, I told you they make it the same way since the 1960s. And this way they will have toxin, they will inject dogs, and they'll have a new anti-serum that will be much more cleaner product and they'll be able to distribute toxin. Now why I talk about small company in Australia, it doesn't exist anywhere else except the east coast of Australia. So a big company doesn't care about um, investing money, whereas cattle tick um, companies are sitting there waiting and one company has invested in this work. Uh, do I have in the cattle tick? Not so much paralysis tick. And, um, and again, I went a lot faster than I thought I would be. So um, Pliny the Elder said a long time ago, 
ill-favoured ticks, the foulest and nastiest creatures there be. And uh, there's my dog. And uh, <laughs> this is a Brahmin with an evil eye of ticks hanging off it. And um, that's just a cartoon about how many more fleas and tick seasons do I have left? Um, it's a good question. I'm wondering about that myself. Um, and that's all I had to say, and it went faster than I thought. I hope I didn't go too fast. That's the slowest I've ever spoken in my life. <laughs> Ask pet. <laughs> Well, paralysis tick, it's only a small company, but we do have uh, a company working with us for the cattle tick. Uh, th I don't know if it's the same here, but big animal health companies are not based in Australia. They're all based in the US or Europe, mostly, right? So they've given some money to the Australian cohort, and I have telephone calls with the company representative in the US. But the amount of money they've put in is not large. It's sort of going baby steps. I don't know how to explain it. And, uh, yeah. And if this next trial uh, is successful, they'll go forward. As pet, as pet knows, there's like eight different cattle tick vaccine patents now that people have. Which does the company choose? So different companies are working with different people around the world and everybody's sort of risk averse and uh, we will see. So for me, um, I've spoken to companies about this. It's a little, what I've noticed is I can get lots of money to do research. When you get to a point where you've got something that you've patented, not everybody is throwing as much money at you. It, had I known that, I would have quarantined some money to do important things instead of doing a whole lot of discovery stuff that I mean, we did sidelines as well. We looked at RNA interference. We did all this other. We were trying to do science as well. But if we weren't, if we were commercially smarter, we wouldn't have done all this side stuff. But at the same time, we all are trying to be scientific career, right? We weren't working for any company, so I think. So now I spoke to a company. I said, "Why is it that there's a lot of funding for discovery?" but there isn't a lot of funding for taking that discovery next. And they said, out of nine commercial things that we look at, one makes it to market. So if they're looking at it from a business point of view, that's why it's very small, risk averse steps. Does that make sense? Yeah.
I did an analysis of tick patents as a sort of a book chapter for fun and um, one is from Brazil and they patented at the point where their mixture was successful for cattle tick and in Australia they told us we couldn't patent it. We couldn't patent in 2010, they said. You have to separate all the components and then patent the, um, the good components. So they, the Brazil group painted, patented that vaccine in Australia and it went through and I don't know how it went through because they're giving us advice that you can't patent but they'll put it through. It's really strange. I don't know where, that's Isabel's work, I don't know where they are with that but um, they had a mixture of four proteins that gave them an e efficacy. And um, then they published it, uh, but I'm not sure, I haven't heard any more. So I don't know whether they have the same problem with the companies.
cattle ticker up here. Corella's stick is all down the coast, right? 